In this video, we'll provide a brief introduction to the basic operating principles and uses of integrated circuit injection locked oscillators. To get our bearings, I think it's useful to just first understand what an injection locked oscillator looks like. So focus first on the ring injection locked oscillator shown here on the left. Essentially what we have in this very simple ILO is a three-stage ring oscillator composed of these three inverters. But imagine that there's an input to this injection locked oscillator where a high frequency clock can be applied. So this inverter here is sort of fighting with this inverter here for control of this node. The ring has its own resonant frequency it would like to operate at, but depending on the frequency and phase of the injecting input coming in from the left, this inverter may tug the oscillator frequency or phase to either be a little bit earlier or faster or a little bit later or slower. So that is the injection. And ultimately, if the injecting signal is strong enough, the circuit will lock to the injecting input and the output will have many of the characteristics of the input. We'll have its frequency and we'll have a phase that's related to the phase of the input. A very similar behavior is observed from this injection locked LC oscillator here. Again, neglecting the outer end MOS transistors here, we would just have an LC oscillator, which would have its own oscillating frequency as determined by the resonant frequency of the tank, one over root LC. However, the injecting inputs here, if the clock frequency is close to the resonant frequency, can influence the frequency and phase at the output of this injection like the LC oscillator. Again, it requires a certain relationship between the input frequency and the resonant frequency. That is, they have to be close enough together in order for the circuit to lock. And intuitively, we may understand that a certain amplitude is required from the injecting input. A very tiny injecting input can't hope to overcome the sort of natural frequency of either of these oscillator circuits. An analogy I like to use here is with a pendulum or a person on a swing here. This is an oscillator, as we know. And if you're pushing a person on a swing, that's injection locking the oscillator. So the simplest case is that you push the person on the swing right at its resonant frequency. When you do so, very little effort is required. Essentially, you just provide a light touch to overcome any losses, any friction in the system. And the person will keep oscillating at the resonant frequency as determined by the length of the pendulum, for example. However, as you may know, you can change the frequency of oscillation here if you wish. If you push hard enough, you can push faster and if you when you start doing so you'll actually be pushing as the person is swinging back to you so it'll look like this huh. you'll be pushing before the swing is even complete but if you push hard enough the frequency of this oscillation will change to match that of your pushing So to understand what this might look like, let's just take a very simple model of an oscillator as shown here. So let's assume that the circuitry is uh, producing a feedback loop that produces a waveform with a linear phase shift. In this case, the assumption is it's a current waveform that uh, has a linear phase shift compared to a current waveform elsewhere in a circuit. And um, if that phase shift is 360 degrees and the gain is greater than one, then around this feedback loop, we would expect to see oscillations with growing amplitude. But typically, there's some nonlinearity present in the loop that limits the amplitude of these oscillations and prevents them from blowing up. For example, the oscillation amplitude may simply be limited by the available supply voltage or maximum current uh, that's being limited by some current sources somewhere. So that nonlinearity limits the amplitude of the oscillations and such an oscillator just continues to free run at this frequency where uh, HVCO has 360 degrees of phase shift. So 
this is an oscillator without injection. And in this case, obviously, the current waveform here, it, the fa its phasor representation has the same magnitude, same phase as this waveform here because there's no uh, injection. Now, what happens when we introduce an injecting input into this model? Well, let's first consider the case where we're injecting the oscillator right at its resonant frequency. So we're perfectly in sync with the natural frequency of the oscillator. If we do so, then the steady state condition, the only steady state condition that makes sense is that the injecting input is precisely phase aligned to the output uh, phasor of the oscillator so that the two phasors superimposed constructively as shown, as shown here. The, superimpo the two superimposed waveforms at IL are therefore also at the exact same phase but with higher magnitude. The limiter serves to limit the resulting magnitude back to IOS, as we uh, expect here. So this then is the steady state condition when we inject an injection locked oscillator right at its resonant frequency. So the injecting frequency omega injection is equal to the resonant frequency omega naught. And that is arising right at the frequency where HVCO has 360 degrees phase shift. So the injecting input is at the exact same phase as the output of the oscillator, and um, they're also at the same frequency so that the lock is maintained, and uh, we can provide a very, very small amplitude here and sustain the oscillations in this way. This fits our intuition with the pendulum here. Again, we only need to push it very, very lightly to maintain the oscillations if we're operating at the resonant frequency. And inevitably, our light pushes will be precisely aligned to the phase of the pendulum. Now again, let's imagine that rather than injecting at the resonant frequency of the oscillator, let's inject faster. And if we do so, we'll start pushing even as the pendulum is swinging back to us. But if we do that hard enough, we'll actually change the frequency. And eventually, if we're pushing hard enough, the pendulum will be swinging back and forth exactly in time with the injecting input. However, you'll note that there will be some phase shift between the natural oscillation and our pushing. And if you've ever pushed someone on a swing like this, you'll know this to be true. If you try and push them faster than their resonant frequency, you're always pushing them when they're still swinging back to you. So you got to push a little harder to overcome that. And that's exactly the behavior that's exhibited in injection locked oscillators. There's a phase shift in steady state between the injecting input and the oscillating waveform. And we have to inject a little harder to get it to lock. We can use this phaser model to better understand the relationship between the injecting input phase and the ILO output phase. So in this case, we're injecting at a frequency different from the resonant frequency of the ILO, different by some amount delta omega. As a result, the phase shift through HVCO here is no longer 360 degrees. And the situation pictured here where delta omega is negative, then the phase shift is less than 360 degrees. So as a result, the signal here is not the phaser, I should say, is not aligned with the phaser at the output of the ILO. So you've got IOS with a phase shift that differs from that of IL. And the difference between those phasers is determined by the amount by which the phase deviates from 360 degrees, which in turn depends on the frequency offset delta omega. So we inject further away from the resonant frequency we get more phase shift arising between these two phasers here. Now, as a result, the injecting phaser must be the one that makes up the difference between those two. So since looking over here, it's clear that IL has to equal I injection plus IOS, that is the phaser, the phasers have to add up 
then that means that I injection must line up perfectly on this phasor graph up here. So clearly, the resulting output of the ILO will be at a phase very different from the injecting input. The two differ by the angle theta that can be computed from knowledge of the phase shift phi, which in turn depends on the phase response of the oscillator circuitry. And uh, it also depends on the magnitude of the injecting input, I injection. So this um, can lead to a potentially useful application of injection locked oscillators. By operating the injection locked oscillator at a frequency away from its resonant frequency, it can provide a variable phase shift to the clock. We can control this phase difference, delta omega, by tuning the VCO. Again, tuning it away from the frequency of the injection, omega injection. If it's the ring VCO, for example, we can change its resonant frequency by changing the delay of the constituent delay elements in the ring. If it's an LC VCO, an LC oscillator, we can change its resonant frequency by changing the value of the capacitors in the tank. And in doing so, we change delta omega and therefore change phi and theta, the phase shifts between input and output. So we can use this as a variable phase shifter. Here's an example of what that can look like. Imagine that you've got an LC injection locked oscillator and you're injecting it at a constant frequency of 19 gigahertz. And on the x-axis here, imagine that you're changing the value of the capacitor in the tank. You've implemented it as a varactor and you're sort of detuning it away from the injected frequency, 19 gigahertz. Now, when you tune the LC oscillator to be precisely at 19 gigahertz, you observe zero phase shift between input and output clock. But as you move away from 19 gigahertz, you get a controllable amount of phase shift. The relationship's not quite linear, of course, as you might expect from the phasor relationships we pictured on the last slide. Also, as mentioned there, you see that the precise relationship between input and output phase also depends on the injection strength which is here quantified by the factor K, the ratio between the oscillator's amplitude and the amplitude of the injecting input signal. So K equal to 0 0.3 means that the injecting input has an amplitude that's 30% that of the oscillator's free running amplitude. These, by the way, are actual measured results shown with blue symbols of a CMOS LC oscillator. So this sort of thing can be used and is used in practice to achieve variable phase shift. 